This is Football Night in America, served by Applebee's. Welcome into the FNIA podcast, served by Applebee's. You know, the Hall of Famer, Coach Dungy Rodney, still doing the red eye back and forth from LA. I know he interviewed Harbaugh, a handful of other Chargers for Football Night in America, and he was fired up about those interviews. So I'm, I'm excited to hear him. So, Coach, we're going to start with the news of the week here. And I feel like we just did this a few weeks ago in the opposite direction with the Indianapolis Colts. They made the decision to go with Joe Flacco and said it would be for the extent of the year for the foreseeable future. Now they're going back to Anthony Richardson and saying the exact same thing that it's going to be for the rest of the year. Your take on this one, coach. Well, I was for the move to Joe Flacco, but I'm going to say this. Stop this. It's for the whole year and the foreseeable future. Hey, Anthony Richardson's our quarterback right now, and we're going to play this out and see what happens and go back to him. I think you make a mistake when you put yourself, you dig yourself a hole and say, we're going to do this for the rest of the year. No one can foresee the future. And so Flacco didn't get the job done for them. I thought he would play much better. They're going back to Richardson. That's fine. Go back to him and let it play out and see what happens, Jack. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, Coach. And I, I really respect the way that Anthony Richardson handled this whole situation. I thought he was really professional on the field when we had him in that game in Minnesota. And obviously it didn't go Flacco's way. You know, Flores got the best of him. He throws more interceptions the next week. But Richardson, I just thought, handled it like a pro and good for him now to get another chance. Yeah, no, you're right. And I talked to Anthony in the tunnel uh, before the game started, and I told him to keep his head up. Uh, You're going to get another shot. I don't know if it's this year, next year, down the road for another team, but you're going to be a good player in this league. Well, three weeks later, he gets that shot back, and his teammates still have respect for him because of the way he handled it, just like you said. Yeah, and this will ultimately tie into our Sunday night game this week as this show goes along, and we'll be talking about the Colts, the Denver Broncos, a couple of those teams in the AFC, and the competition with the Cincinnati Bengals for that last playoff spot. But something you wanted to talk about with this prior week, Coach, was Week 10, poor situational football. What were you seeing out there? Well, as you know, we're sitting in the truck, and we're watching six, seven, eight games in a row, and they all – come down to the last three, four minutes of the game. And you see some teams just play with poise and execute. And then you see other teams where you you sit there and scratch your head. What are they thinking? What are they not understanding about this? Um, we saw Seattle a couple of weeks ago throw a touchdown pass on the last play of the half to DK Metcalf, and he's wide open from 40 yards deep. And you, you're saying, how can this happen? Well, we're sitting there and we're watching the same thing. The, the Denver Broncos. Uh, They're going to upset the Kansas City Chiefs. They drive it down, do a great job on offense, uh, point-blank range field goal. All they got to do is knock it through. What happens? The Chiefs block it. Well, it's great from the Chiefs' standpoint, but we saw a couple breakdowns. Number one, you see the kicker uh, with a low kick, just a regular trajectory kick. At that point, the only thing that can stop you is a block. You got to kick that ball up high. Uh, That's just common standard procedure at that point. And then their protection. Uh, The Chiefs said they saw a little glitch. They got close two or three times. Well, if you're the special teams coach of the Broncos, you've got to get that address and say, hey, we know they're going to attack here. You can't let that kick get blocked in the last minute of the game, last second. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable all the ways that Kansas City continues to win. It seems like (laughs) the vast majority Almost all of their wins have come by seven points or fewer. And they just figure out these ways down the stretch. And, you know, Pacheco's going to come back, coach. They're going to start getting some of their guys back. And now they got D Hop out there on the outside. It just looks again like who the heck is going to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. But but you talk about them, Jack, winning in the final moments, winning these tight games. Andy Reid is an old school coach. They're on the details and all of their their players embrace that. Uh, the week before, before they're playing Tampa. I'm watching the replays of it because I, I live in Tampa, want to see what happened to the Bucs in overtime. And they've got Patrick Mahomes mic'd up and they're running the ball and they're going to score. They're inside and he's in the huddle and telling uh, everybody, hey, take care of business. Kareem Hunt, both hands on the ball. We're giving it to you. Make sure you got both hands on the ball. Sure enough, he goes in there and they score. Well, now we've got the Giants last week. And they're in overtime against the Panthers. And the first play, they fumble the ball. Tracy fumbles it. 
And yeah. I, I just want – is Daniel Jones in there like Patrick Mahomes said, hey, we're in overtime, both hands on the ball now. Just little details make the difference between being a championship team and an also ring. I think that's one heck of a point. So some of that in-game audio is so cool to hear. And then you get to hear that, what I would call elite levels of leadership. I think yes. that Tom Brady did forever. Peyton Manning did forever. That are, you know, they, they seem like they're this big, but it's the difference between winning an overtime game like that and losing an overtime game. Yeah, we're, we're watching uh, the Steelers and the Commanders coming right down to the wire. Uh, Pittsburgh's trying to run the clock out. They get the third down play, and it comes up a little short. The ball's right around midfield, and you and I and Rodney were sitting in there. Pittsburgh's offense comes on the field, and we, we tell each other, there's no way they're snapping this ball. Mike Tomlin is a defensive coach. He's not going to give up the ball at midfield. He's going to punt this thing down and rely on his defense. Well, they get up to the line of scrimmage. Russell goes, hut, hut, and Washington jumps off sides. And where was the defensive captain? Where was that Patrick Mahomes of that defense saying, hey, guys, make sure you watch the ball. Don't be offside. They may not snap the ball. Just those little reminders. Where is that leadership coming from? Yeah. yeah I, I remember Mike Tomlin just saying, he first of all, was smiling. As soon as he got on the jump, and he just said, that's game. As soon as he said, as soon as he yeah. said that's game. Because he knew it. He knew exactly what he was doing to him, coach. And there is no way he's going to snap that ball. I, I've known Mike for 25 years. And with the type of defense that they have, he's going to make you beat him the long way. He's not going to take a chance on giving you the ball at the 50-yard line, making five yards and kick a long field goal to win the game. So uh, it yep. just you knew they weren't going to snap the ball. But Washington, in the moment, young team, energetic, trying to get that stop, jumps off sides, and, and you lose the game. And those now we're getting to the point, Jack, where those games – are meaningful. That that could be the difference between winning the division and being a wild card or just missing the playoffs. Uh, and it's just executing in the in crunch time. Oh, absolutely. And one of the other things we were watching a lot of is some of these officiating misses. And it's it's the officiating league wide coach to me is becoming a fascinating thing. How you know the challenge flag is slowly becoming extinct with this replay assist. And we're doing so much of it from New York it seems like there really shouldn't be a missed call anymore if we can watch everything in slow-mo and get it right. And and I think, Jack, we have to get to that. I don't know what's going to happen this offseason, but we've seen too many examples of big plays in the final moments where uh, where is the replay assist and does it get turned over? And then we've got some categories that can get turned over and some categories that can't. Uh, again, I live in Tampa, so uh, the Bucks are playing a couple of weeks ago. Bucky Irvin fumbles a ball right at the end of the game. They're running out the clock. If they run out the clock, they're going to win the game. And he fumbles. So they look at it. Was his knee down? Well, they look at it and know his knee's not down. The ball's coming loose. But he's grabbed by the face mask, clear as day. Right. So now you say, well, no, his knee wasn't down. It was a fumble. But what about the face mask call? Well, we can't <laughs> fix that because that's a judgment call. Uh, the league is going to have to do something about that. We've seen this over and over. Sam Darnold in the end zone for safety. They review it because it's a scoring play, clearly tackled by the face mask. Yep. Nothing we can do. We give them a safety. The game's over. Uh, that can't continue to happen. Not if you've got this replay assist and, and all the technology we have. Yeah. I, I like the fact that they're being honest about it now and just saying what it is. I mean, they're watching the <laughs> yes. game from New York too. And just say it, you know, people will always respect it. If you tell them what's going on and they are, there's, you know, thanks to replay assist, that was a fumble, what have you. But once you start doing this, it's like, okay, let's just get it right. Let's, let's apply it to all things and just get it right. Cause people will never be mad at you. They're watching at home. They know you missed the call. You know, so if they know, you should know. Just fix yeah, it. Just yeah. get right with them. And, and where did, where does that stop, though? I mean, in that uh, Minnesota Indy game that we had, there's yeah. a fumble recovery touchdown, but a yep. flag's down. The referee throws the flag, looks like the quarterback got hit in the face. Well, replay assist, looked at it, and didn't think it was a forcible blow, so they pick up the flag and let it go. Um I don't understand why we can fix some things, but we can't fix other things. If we've got replay assist, it ought to assist on everything. My guess is that's where it's going. They Sometimes they tend to <laughs> or tiptoe towards these type of things as opposed to dive straight into the pool. And so I think that's probably where we're going. Let's get to who is eating good in the neighborhood, Coach, and that is presented by Applebee's. 
And Coach Tom, let's just stay with the Pittsburgh Steelers. His decision to go with Russell Wilson, and you were all over this from the jump. Even when it wasn't trendy or cute to say it, Coach, you knew it would be Russ. We we talked about it, and I had the uh, just good fortune of being at practice before the Dallas Pittsburgh game. And Russell wasn't moving around a hundred percent. You could tell he was still favoring his calf a little bit, but the balls he was throwing were so on point, Jack. And I watched those receivers just catch these balls right between the numbers and smiles on their face. And I remember saying, it's just a matter when he gets healthy, he's going to be in there. And I asked Mike about it at the time and he gave him one of those Mike Tomlin. Well, we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. (laughs) But I knew what he was driving at. And when he made the decision, so many people, oh, what's Tomlin doing? He's crazy. They're winning. You can't change. This is your quarterback of the future, Justin Fields. But Mike was watching practice, and he had a feel of this team. And then they go out and get Mike Williams, who is a deep ball receiver, and you've got a quarterback that throws one of the best deep balls in football. So they've added to their offense to go with that great defense, and they are eating good right now. They are. It's it's really energized pickings too. You know, I, I I feel like his energy is just so different now. He's getting these opportunities, and they're they're putting the ball up in the air. And it seems to be what he does best is just go and find it. I mean, the catch he made this past week, rotating his body almost in a full circle to go find that thing. And to your point, getting Mike Williams to get him cheap, you know, and he's still coming back from an injury, so he's only going to get better and better and better. The Jets really weren't using him. This could really end up being one of those trades you look back and go, they got Mike Williams for what? What a deal I think it'll be. (laughs) And the big plays that he has the potential to make down down the road. And and I'll tell you what was happening, Jack. Justin Fields was playing good ball. He was scrambling. He was making plays. But he was going to his first read. If that guy was open, he would deliver the ball. If not, now he's moving around. He's scrambling. He's running. Well, if you're a receiver and you're the number two guy in the route, or the number three guy, and you find yourself getting open, but the ball's not coming, that Mm -hmm. gets disappointing. That wears on you. Well, now they put Russell Wilson in, and all five guys are energized that are running that route. If I get open, I could get the ball. And you could just see the difference. And we sensed it when we were at that that game against the Jets. Uh, Rodney mentioned the the energy from the Steelers' offense especially, and uh, you could feel what Russell was going to bring. Yeah, and Fields may get there one day, but I just thought that Russ has such a command of the game and a calm and a veteran presence that that has given them something else. They're going to play great defense. They're going to be scrappy as heck. They're going to run the football. they got a great one-two punch now with both their running backs getting healthy. But he just gives them a calm and a command at the line of scrimmage. That and I thought it was really interesting after our game, listening to Coach Tomlin say, I learned a lot about Russ in this game just how he rode the adversity because they were down yep. and it looked ugly. They were even getting booed a little He's bit. By the booed, yep. But he hung in there, coach, and he, and he showed that veteran presence. No question about it. And, and that's what he's going to bring to the table. And now you've got a quarterback. You're, you're going into this playoff drive, and it's great to have Justin Fields and his athleticism. And Justin's going to be good down the road. But now you've got a quarterback, Jack, that's been in Super Bowls, that's won Super Bowls. Uh, you know how that energizes the team. Hey, this guy can take us there. Uh, their defense feels better about things. The, the city feels better about things. Uh, th- this was a great move, in my opinion. I'm amazed by the Pittsburgh Steelers this year. Just the, one of the cheapest quarterback rooms in the NFL and, and what they've been able to build around. It's just been masterful. It's a Mike Tomlin masterpiece, right? It's just, you know, you guys think that Russell Wilson's done and Denver said this is the worst you know, pick up that we've done and we wasted all this money. Okay, great. Come here. You know, we'll put you in a situation where you can play winning football, you know, fields they are done with you in Chicago. Come here. We'll find a role for you in the way they won with fields. Now they're winning with Russ. I mean, it's, they're one of the only teams in the NFL. I think could pull something like this off. Young receiver core. And then the defense is built around that pressure up front and you've got TJ Watt. Well, you know that, well, Alex Highsmith on the other side, but then we've got other guys who can contribute and do the same thing. And we want a little bit of depth. We'll go out and get Preston Smith and, uh, you know, see what he can do. And now they need him, but that's just, I think a smart organization putting pieces together that they know fits for them may not fit for everybody else, but for what they do, uh, they've got it going and and, uh, they're going to be a tough out down the stretch. Yeah, they sure are. They got a big one coming up this week too. We got Ravens and Steelers. 
in week 11. And the Ravens just coming off that win where they had to come from behind against Cincinnati. And it would have been a huge win for Cincy to get to themselves back in that real playoff mix. I know they still are, but they need this one Sunday badly. Ravens come back at home and get it done. Now we have Ravens Steelers. What's top of mind on this matchup week 11? Well, this is big for the Ravens because to, to go in there and win in Pittsburgh would really set them up. Their offense is playing outstanding. Their skill position guys are all over the place making plays. Derrick Henry, my goodness, what he's brought to the table. And to me, that's got to be the key. If I'm them, you got to pound this Steeler defense with Derrick Henry and make them respect that because defensively now, Baltimore is not playing what we've come to know as Ravens defense. And mm -hmm. they could be vulnerable. So I think this is going to be a high-scoring game. But if I'm John Harbaugh, I say, I pound my big man in there. I use the clock. I make them defend Derek. And then I'm going to get the shots, the one-on-ones from Lamar. And I, I, I don't need to score 40 points to win this game. I need to control the clock and time of possession. And let's make Pittsburgh panic a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And we got another good one in the AFC as well. I mean, these are just awesome games. The Chiefs and the Bills going head to head. And this is a fascinating one, Coach. So before we get into this matchup, I was having this conversation at lunch and I just want to float it to you. It's a team building philosophy. Uh, and it ties into our game this weekend, but it ties into the Chiefs. It ties into the Bills. Both these teams had number one wide receivers in Diggs and Tyreek Hill. And both of them eventually let them go with what this receiver money has become. And it is shot through the stratosphere. It just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. The Bengals are going to be in the same situation where we're paying our quarterback, you know, 50 plus million dollars. Do we want to pay Jamar almost $40 million and have two guys making close to a hundred million dollars? Or do we want to take the chiefs and the bills philosophy? How do you see team building in this modern age and what top receiver money has become? You know, you, there's two things that you're battling, Jack. Number one, you want to take care of your players. When guys play well for you, you want to take care of them and pay them because that motivates the locker room and that helps everybody out. But when you get to the level of the Chiefs and the Bills and the Bengals and you're a Super Bowl contender, that means you've got a lot of good players. You're going to be tight against that salary cap. So you've got to make tough decisions. And I can tell you, when I was in Indy with Bill Poley and Bill his motto, and I never forgot it, he said, Tony, we have to pay for special and we have to pay for what we can't get anyplace else. But if we can get it, we have to then utilize that and pay our guys that we can't replace. So mm -hmm. we had those same discussions. Hey, we've got Peyton Manning coming up. We've got to take care of him. We've got Marvin Harrison. We've got to take care of him. Well, Edron James is a really, really good player, and he's in that same category. He is special. But you know what? If we pay Edron, we're going to lose Reggie Wayne, Dwight Freeney, Dallas Clark down the road. And if we don't pay Edron, we can draft. And this year's draft coming up that year was Maurice Jones-Drew, Joseph Adai, Lawrence Maroney. So we can take care of our special guys and then replace Edron with something close to it. And it hurt. It, that's hard to do, to let Edwin James walk, but it was the right, right thing to do. And that's what Kansas City has done. Yeah, Tyreek Hill is special, but you know what? We can draft Xavier Worthy and train him and go down the road, and now we can take care of some of these guys like a Chris Jones that maybe we can't replace. And that, uh, that, that it's, it's a tough call, but that's what you have to do. It is a really tough call, but I think about when they got five draft picks – for Tyreek and that trade to Miami five picks is what they got, including a first rounder for him. And you get to move on from that contract. So now Travis Kelsey has a bigger role to your point. Yes. They start breaking receivers. Yes. And to me, receiver seems to be a position where there's a lot of good talent out there. There might not be a lot of Jamar chases. And I understand that you got to pay for the Jamar chase, but Dallas is another good example of this coach. You know, they, they paid yes. that crest all that money. They pay CD lamb, all that money, flashy, fun things, but they stink this year. You know, they stink. Yeah. And you're losing other guys. You're losing your depth. And um, you you really have to make those decisions. And it, it is difficult. Our best players, we can't afford to lose them. But uh, the other thing that speaks to Jack is 
making some of those decisions early. If two years ago you knew Dak Prescott was going to be your franchise quarterback and you knew how good C.D. Lamb was, get it done then so you don't have to pay top of the market and you've got guys locked up for a while. That's the other thing I think you have to do. And we see Cincinnati in that same boat. Hey, yeah, we got some cheap years with Jamar Chase, but now we've got to make a decision. Do we pay him at the top of the receiver uh, chart or do we let him go? Maybe if you'd assigned him two years ago, you wouldn't have to make that decision. That's it. If you thought he wanted more than Justin Jefferson last year, he's going to want way more than Justin Jefferson <laughs> after this yeah, year. After that game he put up against Baltimore, I think he proved uh, how much they need him. A- amen to that, Coach. All right, so Kansas City and Buffalo, really interesting conversation. I appreciate you having that with me. This game, what are you thinking about watching this one? You know, you look at Buffalo and you say, this is their time, this is their year. Kansas City's not playing that well. But uh, this is such a big game for Buffalo because if they don't win it, then you pretty much conceded the Chiefs the number one seed. Nobody's going to catch them. Uh, So there's a lot of pressure on the Bills, and they've got to play a clean game. They've got to play defensively and put the pressure on Mahomes. And then offensively, you've got to take advantage of things. And sometimes I think that gets to Buffalo when they play the Chiefs. They think, hey, we've got to score touchdowns. Josh Allen, I've got to do crazy stuff in the red zone. Hey, maybe we'll go for a fake punt on, on fourth and five. Those things you you can't do. You've got to just play your game and know that you're good enough to win. If Buffalo can do that, they have a shot. But you have to beat the Chiefs. The Chiefs are not going to give you the game. Yeah, that's it. Let's take a look at the playoff picture right now and, and where it sits. So we mentioned this at the top of the podcast here, Coach. So the division leaders, Kansas City, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and Houston. Now Baltimore is going to play Pittsburgh this week, so that could get interesting. The Rams are making it. The Chargers are going to play the Bengals this week, so that can be interesting. But look at those teams that are battling for that last playoff spot, that last wild card spot. Denver, Indy, and Cincy. Who do you trust most out of that group right now? Well, you and I, you were talking about uh, on our postgame show last week, could Cincy run the table? And I think they can. I think they're the most talented team out of that group, and they may have to run the table to do it. And it's going to start with this Charger game, uh, but they can make a run and go. What, what you're looking at is a lot of teams with two-game leads. Uh, Buffalo's got a big lead in their division. Kansas City's got a big lead in their division. Houston's got a two-game lead in their division. So those positions are pretty much locked up. Pittsburgh and Baltimore, you you have to say one of them is going to be the division winner, one of them is going to be the wild card. So you're really looking at just a couple of spots. And if I'm uh, Cincinnati Bengals coach Zach Taylor, nobody likes to say this. And nobody likes to say, hey, this is critical and we've got to win this. But you're getting to that point. We've got to take care of business. We do have to run the table. And, uh, guys, I need your best every week. Yeah. And if you watch the Thursday night game, I thought he coached it like that. Fourth down. Yes. They were going for it. No question. Two-point conversion yep. at the end of the game. We're going for it. No question. So they already have that kind of back, firmly pressed against the wall mentality, even more so this week. But if they can find a way to beat the Chargers, it's not going to be easy being that it's in L.A., the good news is they do have the 10 days off coming off the Thursday night football loss, so at least be able to get some rest going into this. And we've seen that benefit, or even Houston. I know they end up losing the game. Yeah. They came out firing against Detroit. No, that, that will help them. And I think the sense of urgency, too. You know, the Chargers want to win this game. They want to keep it rolling. But you look at the Bengals, and for them, this is a must-win game. We don't want to go to seven losses. We have a chance to knock the Chargers back down with us. Um, you're going to see the best of what Cincinnati can bring. And, and I think it's going to be very good. And coach, they they took the Kansas City Chiefs all the way to the wire in Kansas City. The Ravens twice they've had yes. well against the ropes and should have won at least one of those games, if not both of those games, in, in Baltimore when they had the lead over them. So this is a team that's four and six. And then, of course, the New England loss in week one, which continues to haunt them just like a dark cloud in the sky over this team because it would have been looking different without that. But they're right there with the best teams in the NFL. And then they have the disappointment to stew in of being four and six. It's really an interesting place that they're in. It is. They're four and six. And I promise you, nobody wants to play them because you know what they could do 
And if they get in the playoffs, they're, they're going to be a team that can do some damage. But what they've got to do is string together four or five weeks of very good football and get themselves in this race. Yeah. And, and from a pass rush perspective, because one of the things that we always talk about when we start looking at these teams, coaches, can they protect the passer? And then can they rush the passer, particularly with four? With their D-line, can they get after them? And that's just been something that the Bengals have not been able to do, is protect Joe Burrow ever. And then their only pass rush is really coming from Trey Hendrickson. Yeah, and that that is going to be the story of this game for sure. Uh, Chargers are playing great defense. They are uh, limiting scores. They're doing a, a good job. Jim Harbaugh has brought a tough guy mentality to this team. They've got... Khalil Mack, they've got Bosa, they've got some guys who can get after the passer. If they get after Joe Burrow and rattle him and make him move around, that's the way they're going to stop him. If they can't rush him, th this wide receiver group and the tight end group can get open and they can score points. Other side of the coin, Justin Herbert, special athlete, Cincinnati's got to find a way to get pressure. Whoever pressures the passer the best is going to win this game, no doubt about it. Yeah, and this is going to be, you know, Chargers have had a really favorable schedule for year one of Coach Harbaugh. If you go look at it, they haven't had the toughest schedule to get to this point. Burrow is going to be, for sure, one of the better quarterbacks that they have played, but their defense, they're going to have like 13 points a game. It's the number one scoring defense in the NFL. The two guys I'm looking at, that whether they come back or not this week, Orlando Brown Jr. at the left tackle spot, if he can go for Cincinnati, and T. Higgins, because they're a different team when both those guys are out there. And when they're not, it gets a little scary for Joe. Yeah. Orlando definitely helps with the protection. And T. Higgins, uh, he is so critical to them because you know uh, in the crucial moments, Jamar Chase is going to get doubled. So yep. if that's the case, do I, if I'm Joe Burrow, do I force it into my number one guy and say he's going to be double coverage? Well, when T's out there, he doesn't have to do that. If you're going to single T Higgins, Burrow says, Hey, I'll go to this guy and I'll take my chances and we're going to win 90% of those. It seems like when T is not out there, then that's when things get cloudy for Cincinnati. And uh, I think they're going to be at full strength and I think they're going to put up some points. It's re it's really fascinating, the, the AFC right now and the battle. I mean, we're only week 11, but we're really honing in on this battle for the last wild card spot because we've had Indy really regress. Denver is one of those teams with the rookie quarterback where you're still trying to figure out exactly, but they are playing good defense, so they've been in it all these games. And then Cincinnati, who's just been all over the place this year, and if they can figure it out and get hot, you got to think that they're probably the team that could make a run, maybe more so than Indy and Denver, if they can get things right. And, and everybody in the AFC now is rooting for Cincinnati in this game because the Chargers are sitting there, as you say, great schedule. They only have three losses. If the Chargers win this game, they're, that pretty much is going to lock up a wild card spot for them. Yeah. And so now everybody else in the AFC is chasing one spot. But if Cincinnati can win and knock them down to four losses, now we're all in the mix again. And, and so th this is a huge game, not just for the Bengals and Chargers, but for those other contenders in the AFC. That's it. The beauty of flex scheduling. I cannot wait. We got back-to-back -back trips to L.A. coming up. Bengals, Chargers, FNIA starts at 7 p.m. Coach, thanks so much for doing this. Always great seeing you on a Wednesday. Can't wait to be there with you, Jack. We're going to have a great night in L.A. Amen. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.